welcome everybody uh, to this uh, latest uh, in a series on uh, on on india's neighborhood we titled this as neighborhood scope uh, we've had about uh, five or six of these episodes earlier uh, and today uh, we're going to discuss uh, the situation uh, that is developing in the maldives uh, after the recent elections and uh, and i think it's very important because uh, very often uh maldives because it's a small country tends to be ignored in the normal media discourse but i think it is very important for everybody to understand that uh, there's no country which is so big that it can solve all the world's problems and there's no country that is not uh, that is so small that uh, you know uh, it's it's irrelevant or not important and in fact for india at least maldives is an extremely important country it's a neighbor uh and it's uh, very very strategically uh, located uh, and i think it's very important uh, for all of us to uh, to to get a better appreciation of what is happening in the maldives after the recent political developments we have a great panel with us today uh, we have uh, mr mimra abdul gafoor who's an independent researcher in maldives uh, mm-hmm. he's also served as a foreign service officer in the maldivian ministry of foreign affairs and as an assistant director in the maldives president's office we have uh, dr rashida m didi uh, who's also an independent researcher and an academic uh, in the maldives uh, and uh, she uh, was an adjunct lecturer for 8 years at maldives national university where she has taught political science and international relations uh, we have uh, we have radhe tambi you're not a doctor are you Okay, so we have uh, Miss uh, Radhe Radhe Tambi, uh, who's a research associate uh, at the CAPS, the Center for Air Power Studies, uh, and and she focuses on the Indo-Pacific region and U.S. foreign policy. And last but not the least, uh, we have uh, the person who's put together today's program, as he puts together all of the programs with our other colleague Shivam. We have uh, Aditya Gaudara uh, Shivamurthy, who's an associate fellow at the ORF. Uh, who looks at india's foreign policy but focuses on uh, on on india's southern neighbors mostly um, and he's our resident expert on maldives uh, he's written quite a lot uh, so we have a great panel um, and let me uh, set the ball rolling with the most obvious question to uh, mr gafoor uh, on on uh, on the on on what happens now that you will be getting a new government in a month or two uh, and uh, how does politics play on from here uh, does this bring in political stability or do we see more political instability uh, what is the direction in which politics is going to move uh, basically what do where do we go from here do we uh, go in uh, does the present uh, presidential system continue or will there be greater pressure for uh, a parliamentary system or some kind of a mixture of the two uh, just give us a just give us a kind of a road map on where we are going to go from here thank you uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, so in terms of political stability uh, at the outset uh, I, i i would just like to emphasize the context that this was a uh, fairly competitive election uh there were eight candidates who were in the running in the first round and then the last runoff round between president solihu and uh now president elect muiz it proceeded with the minimum disruption with minimum uh challenges and uh just in terms of that it's actually been quite a positive development in terms of our political stability because in contrast to our past elections this one was uh it took place in a far more stable political context so in for instance we transitioned to a democracy in 2008 our first democratically elected administration helmed by mohammed nasheed uh, he was ousted in a coup uh before the completion of his term in uh, 2012 uh the subsequent election in 2013 it witnessed a number of delays uh the first round of the election was annulled uh and in the 2018 elections uh former president yamin abdul gayu uh had uh, incarcerated a number of his political opponents uh 
uh, and it was uh, very much a surprise that Solly was able to even uh, viably contest, let alone win that election. Uh, this government has not uh, been perfect in terms of its democratic credentials, even during the election process. Uh, there have been allegations of uh, vote buying on both sides. Uh, there has been an abuse of state resources. Corruption has been endemic. But leaving that aside, this election was, uh, uh, in comparison to past elections, generally free and fair. And we can expect that there will be a peaceful transition of power uh, come November. Uh, and that there is no uh, President Solihu, immediately after he lost the election, he very gracefully conceded power. So, uh, sorry, conceded the election. So just in terms of this election marring political stability or leading to any kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, unnecessary uh, turbulence, uh, that, that, that will not be there. Having said that, uh, there is potential for turbulence going forward. Uh, as many of you would be aware, uh, Muiz was not the first choice of the PPM-PNC coalition. They had very much uh, been pushing for former President Yamin Abdul Gayu to be their candidate uh, for this election. Uh, he was disqualified from running by our elections commission and subsequently the Supreme Court because he is currently uh, serving a sentence uh, for money laundering. He's being transferred to house arrest now, but uh, formally he is still not a free citizen. Uh, and there is both pressure on Moise to uh, expedite the judicial process that may or may not uh, result in him being released. Uh, but there is potential for friction between the two uh, in the same way that there was friction between President Solihu and uh, former President Mohammed Nasheed, who were key figures within the MDP uh, political context. In terms of whether we continue with a presidential or a parliamentary system, uh, I, that debate has very much be, has subsided for the time being. Uh, this uh, this uh, initiative to drive a parliamentary system in the Maldives is very much associated with former, oh, sorry, former president and current speaker of parliament, Mohammed Nasheed, who had been hedging on the MDP retaining its majority, transitioning to parliamentary system and becoming prime minister. However, I, uh, he, uh, this was not well received by the rest of the MDP leadership. And this is not something that he was able to successfully execute. And this sort of led to a uh, friction between him, him and President Solu. Subsequent to the election, uh, the political party that was founded by Nasheed, the Democrats, which are an offshoot of the MDP, they had been planning on holding a referendum on the 30th of this month, right after the elections. But again, it's not an initiative that would have been well, well received. We have just uh, had a national election and Moiso has a national mandate as our president-elect. Uh, and for the time being, I, I, I I think the general sentiment is that it's uh, it's practical and a bit too soon to sort of initiate such a, a dramatic change to our constitution. Uh, but uh, leading to the future, we will have parliamentary or majlis elections uh, next year in March. Uh, and I think that there is potential that this debate may resurface in the lead up to that election. Uh, I, I think I'll end it for now because I don't want to <laughs> overstay my time. Uh, but uh, I can thank just you. Ask you a follow up uh, on this. You know, uh, about the friction which is likely to come out uh, between Muizu and Yamin over uh, how the judicial process takes place. Uh, surely there will be some pressure on the president uh, to, uh, to maybe tinker with the judicial system in some form or another so that this guy gets off. But if that friction comes about, do you think uh, we could see some kind of democratic backsliding or at the very least some kind of uh, destabilization in the government, especially if uh, some of the support which has been given to Moizu right now uh, starts being uh, pulled out? Uh, is there a possibility of something like that happening or uh, you think it will be just the normal kind of friction which we saw in the last five years? 
Well, it depends on the intentions. Uh, first of all, any executive uh, seeking to influential the judicial branch is by itself a violation of the separation of power. So yes, that would lead to uh, political turbulence. Uh, but in terms of the incentive for Muhammad Muiz to intervene in the judicial process, uh, I, I think it might be more complicated than may, maybe outside the sea on the surface, because Muizu is uh, he's part of the People's National Congress, which is in coalition with the Pro Progressive Party of Maldives, which belongs to Yamin Abdul Gayum. But uh, it's not uh, there is little love loss uh, between the two individuals, and Muizu has just won an election, uh, which the PPMPNC coalition had initially uh, sought uh, for Yamin to contest. Uh, and just by virtue of that, Yamin would be his biggest rival uh, if he were to actually expedite the judicial process and he was able to widely participate in the political landscape of the Maldives. So just from a very Machiavellian uh, political calculation standpoint, I, I, I don't think Moizo has much of an incentive to actually... Uh, put his hands in the judiciary and uh, undertake sort of undue measures to influence how Yamin's court, uh, undue measures to uh, reverse his incarceration. Uh, but we will see. I, I, I don't want to speculate as to his intentions. He has said uh, as president-elect that he is committed to maintaining a free judiciary. Uh, how he will proceed with that in practice uh, is really a matter of speculation. And uh, I, I don't feel comfortable speculating on that point right now. A point you make. Uh, just that I, I don't think any of us uh, would take politicians, what they say at face value. What they say and what they do are quite different things. But let me just turn to uh, Dr. Rashida Didi and just ask her, uh, what was this election all about? Was it, uh, because a lot of people in India feel that this election was entirely about uh, the, the contestation between India and China, uh, the India Out campaign was the primary driver of this particular election. Uh, was it foreign policy uh, or was it domestic politics or was it the impact of foreign policy on domestic politics? What, in your view, was the primary drivers uh, in this election? Dr. Uh, D. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the primary driver would be definitely um, domestic politics. I think it is the foreigners who make such an issue of India versus China um, as, as a predominant uh, cause for election results in the Maldives. For the Maldivians, um, they have much more important things to think of and worry about. For example, shelter, um, you know, do we get a flat? Do people get some housing, independent housing, somewhere to live separately away from 100 people in the family, etc.? I mean, this is an um, overstatement, of course. But they also have other um, more concerns surviving um, reasons for survival for example health now we don't have a decent hospital i mean i'm sorry to say it a hospital where almost everything can be done people have to go to sri lanka uh, india depending on their um, finances or singapore bangkok etc so for maldivians this is also extremely important and then for maldivians they think of things like, do we get taxed if when the new government comes? Um, do we pay a tax which we are not quite used to yet? Um, so these are the more important things. Everyday life is more important for them than China versus India. Most people won't even know we had that the governments were uh, aligned with either China or India, etc. So I would say it's domestic. And there were other factors that led to uh, the results of this election. 
For example, the division of the MDP, you know, by forming, as you know, former President Nasheed <clears throat> formed a separate party called the Democrats. And when I look at the votes, all those are all those people who voted for the Democrats. Obviously, uh, I don't know, I don't know which ones, but then by looking at the figures, they are part of the MDP people, um, the uh, President Solihu's party people. So they would have all voted for President Solihu, in which case, if you add the uh, figures, you can see that the voters, uh, the, the votes are more than what Moizu, President-elect Moizu got in the election. So that's also a domestic um, issue. Then, of course, then there's the domestic issue of um, um, people people being employed in um, government sectors. Or oh, there's overemployment. In some cases, I'll give you an example. For example, um, some years ago, like about ten years ago, maybe. Uh, the Maldives High Commission in Valencia had like four people, and four people could run that mission. But now I think there are something like 17 people. Now, is this necessary? This is absolutely money going out of drink, being drained out of the uh, government's uh, revenues on people who are, uh, the numbers are unnecessary. The numbers, uh, fewer people can do that. So these are sort of domestic issues that um, govern the the results of the election, uh, results of the election, I would say. I must um, ask you this question uh, on domestic politics. Uh, was a religion a factor in the voting patterns uh, or how politics is being done? Because, you know, over the years we've been hearing, even in the case of uh, President or President-elect uh, Moizu, uh, there have been charges or allegations, accusations that he's uh, very closely uh, related to uh, uh, a, a fundamentalist party called the uh, Jamiatul Salaf. Uh, you know, so there are those kind of allegations. Has that been a factor in politics or is that just a sideshow? It's uh, so the Maldives in the Maldives, religion and national identity are very linked. So religion will always play a part in our politics uh, to that extent. Uh, most politicians mm -hmm. in the Maldives will place emphasis on how much Islam as a faith means to them. Um, with regard to this Jamayatul Salaf uh, Association, uh, I think there was a lot of anti-campaigning uh, towards Muizu in this regard. Uh, it is, was more a liability to him than it was an asset. Because if you look at the history of uh, politics in the Maldives, parties that uh, identify very closely with very conservative religious uh, views tend to do very poorly in our elections. So if you look at uh, the government's uh, coalition partner, Adalat, which is uh, uh, in coalition with the MDP, they won no seats in the parliamentary election uh, in 2019. And they had won perhaps two seats in the 2014 parliamentary elections. So even the even the viability or even necessity of keeping them even as a coalition partner is very questionable in the Maldives. With regard to the Jamayatul Salaf uh, association with Moizu, he has associations in so far as the, he has in-laws who are embedded uh, in this organization. Uh, however, he has specified in interviews that he is not someone who necessarily subscribes uh, to their world view and uh, I, I, to me he comes across more as a run-of-the-mill politician. He has actually changed his political party a number of times. Muizu used to be a member of the Adalat before he joined the PPM and then the PP, PNC. Um, and he certainly hasn't made a big 
uh, issue out of his association with the Jamaat al Salaf because I, I think he understands that just by looking at the numbers, they're more a liability than an asset. Uh, however, the MDP, they certainly played it up during the campaign where they tried to ascribe very extremist views to him, that which he uh, denies. Um, and they were essentially trying to paint him as a very extremist, very uh, ultra conservative uh, candidate, uh, hoping that that would translate into him losing votes. Uh, so I, I, I think those would be the dynamics at play there. And just turn to you. Uh, how has the election result been received in India? Uh, is there concern? Is there a degree of nonchalance? Is it that, well, it's just a, a, a democratic process in a neighboring country and we'll deal with whichever government there is going to be? Uh, what 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 are you hearing? Uh, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? I think the um, run up to elections were pretty much clear, uh, and and there is no denial that uh, the, either from the Maldives side or from India side that India likes to cooperate with MDP and MDP likes to cooperate with India, and there is no denial of that. It's it's been public, uh, and by going by that and going by the complex history that uh, India has had with uh, PPM and back when Yamin was at the helm of the power, uh, I think it would have been desirable for India to have. MDP back to the power or probably, um, you know, MDP uh, continuing their government. But I think the for now, at least what India sees, it's it's pretty much open to any government that comes to play. I mean, it's it's pretty much a democratic process. There's not much uh, external power can do and will want to do in, in, in a neighboring country, which is newly democratic. Uh, and I think so probably India is open to having this engagement. And, and there have been some green signals coming from the other side as well. Uh, for instance, uh, Muizu's uh, close associates to the party have told that India would be the probably the first destination of Muizu's foreign visit. So these... Um, green lights have been there and India has been reading it. And I think there has been some kind of, um, um, you know, um, willingness even in India. So Pri Prime Minister Modi was the first, uh, you know, world leader to wish Muizu when he won the elections. So I think India is trying to at least have this minimal um, nature of engagements with Maldives and not just shun away our neighbor just because there's a change in the government. Um, and But I think that said, there's a lot of uncertainty on how this relationship will go ahead. Um, especially considering that uh, Muizu himself belongs to a party which has been running a sheer uh, anti-India campaign, politicizing Indian investments, Indian defense partnerships. So I think that concern persists. And uh, although Muizu might not have been a big uh, mouthpiece of India out campaign, but he was pretty much part of the ecosystem that made this campaign whatever it is today. Uh, so there is some concern and especially on multiple occasions, Muizu has expressed that the first day he comes to power, he'll try to push Indian troops out which are like 75 people mostly there for humanitarian assistance and disaster response uh, and uh, surveillance of uh, the uh, the exclusive economic zone so Muizu has been making it clear that he would want uh, the 75 troops out and even during his first meeting he has been um, talking to Indian uh, uh, with, with the Indian diplomat he has emphasized that he would want uh, Indian troops to leave but he would wa rather want to take a very diplomatic approach towards it uh, so from what I see is there's a lot of uncertainty in how it goes and obviously India is willing to have this open negotiations, India is willing to have this uh, nature of interactions with the Maldives and not to interfere too much in whatever is happening um, and uh, I think precisely there's also some green signaling from the other side but to what extent do they want to walk the talk of engaging in diplomatic negotiations because as we see it is questionable because as we see Muizu is a bit of a compromise. I mean, as as Mimra also said, like he walks on a, um, you know, he, he, he won the elections precisely despite him not being the first preferred candidate. So the, obviously you will have to serve to your domestic audience as well who have been voting for you for one reason, uh, one of the reasons that they voted for you is also you bringing up this whole nationalist campaign saying that you will be leading Indian troops out or India is compromising on Maldivian sovereignty, right? So on one level, he'll have to serve his domestic audience, but on the other level, he'll also have to, uh, you know, understand that uh, that Maldives still stays vulnerable from a lot of threats that come from the Indian Ocean. Uh, and India has been a major partner in deterring all of these uh, threats and has also been the first responder to most of the uh, crisis that uh, Maldives confronts. Uh, 
so I think that kind of a signal has been there. So I think it probably depends on how Muizu will want to take this ahead. Will he succumb to his domestic pressure uh, and domestic audience or will he be willing to um, overcome this and uh, embrace a broader india maldives relationship is something that we yet to see. Yeah. So, w what, what Muizu would do, uh, we'll find out uh, soon enough. Uh, maybe, when, when does he uh, take over? 17th, 17th. No. 17th of uh, November. So, maybe by the end of the year, we'll have a good idea on, on what the trajectory of his policies is going to be. Uh, but surely there would be people out here who would be concerned about uh, not just the presence of the handful of uh, you know Indian military personnel who are out there, uh, and 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 uh, but also of uh, you know substantial investments which are there in in Maldives. Uh, surely there would be some concerns in the business community as well because we've not had a very good experience in the past. Mm -hmm when the Yamin government came in and, you know, the whole airport project fell through. Uh, is there something you're hearing on that or are there any assurances coming from uh, the, the newly elected uh, guys that they are not going to repeat the mistakes of the past? No, I do think there are some genuine concerns about how these investment projects might uh, face uh, or what their fate is in the coming future. Because to the run-up of the elections, um, one thing that the opposition ran was a clear anti-India uh, in campaign and also on a, on a strong lines of that uh, the Muizu, uh, sorry, Ibrahim Soli's government is corrupt and has been inefficient in implementing most of these projects, right? And one of these projects that was often shown or, you know, shared uh, very actively on social media was India's Greater Malay Connectivity Project. They've, there have been allegations and there's been consistent sharing of this information that these projects have been... Um, one, that these projects have not been delivered and second, that these projects have been causing more harm than benefit to uh, the uh, coral reefs and, and to the maritime ecosystem in, in the Maldives. So this type of concerns have been flagged by the opposition consistently and then what they have done is they have also promised that once they are in power, they'll be reviewing all of these projects, right? Uh, so now, basically speaking about India's projects in the last five years, I think broadly we can put them into two categories. One are the high impact community development projects, which go up to like 60 in number uh, from the last five years and then there's this um, mega infrastructure projects so in terms of mega infrastructure projects i think these will be the most controversial ones um, considering uh, for example the greater Malay connectivity project and also in terms of looking uh, in the housing projects or uh, in terms of defense cooperation the utf naval harbor uh, i think these will be the most um, uh, these these were the ones that were often prone to criticism and i think these will be the ones that are creating enough anxiety within indian uh, establishments as well. Probably um, uh, Muizu has said that once he's in power, he might review, which is very vague. Uh, again, like as happened in the GMR campaign back in 2011-2012 uh, when this whole thing started politicizing. Uh, eventually, we had to, uh, the Maldives had to kick GMR out, the government in the Maldives, and then had to bring in um, uh, the Chinese uh, investors into the airport. Now, I think that's a pretty much fear that continues to haunt what happens to the Greater Malay Connectivity Project if, if the government doesn't see uh, it favoring or doesn't, uh, the current government doesn't see it favoring Maldives. So I think there is that genuine fear of what is going to happen. Uh, but the major question is, will Maldives be able to take the risk? Providing that Maldives has gone through a horrendous period of COVID, uh, very less tourist incomes, uh, which is now slowly picking up. Uh, will Maldives be able to you know, probably repay whatever uh, remuneration that they have to pay in terms of cancelling these projects. That's a broader question. And at a time when Maldivian economy is not doing excellently great and has a lot of uh, debts and upcoming debts to repay to external players, I, I, I think that's a genuine question that probably the Maldivian uh, government would ask. But again, a lot of it depends on how they would want to play with their domestic audience as well. Radhe Tambi, you know, let just to stick with this whole India-China thing. What has been the record of the Chinese projects in, in, in Maldives? Because the record of the Chinese projects in most of the parts of the world, we know have been, uh, have, have, has not been very good. In the sense that just today, in fact, there's a report uh, on, on the airport project in Pokhara. Uh, which, is, which now appears to be yet another debt trap diplomacy project. 
uh, overpriced, uh, quality problems, all kinds of other issues. Uh, how have the projects unfolded in, in Maldives? And then what is it that makes the Chinese so attractive uh, to the Maldives, uh, even though they have this very dubious track record, uh, as compared to the Indians who have actually been first responders whenever there's been a major crisis in Maldives. So what, in your assessment, is the reason for this, this disconnect, if I might call it that? When we talk about the Chinese involvement, first of all, let's talk about the Chinese involvement in Maldives is something very recent. It has just picked up in the uh, last two decades and they opened their uh, mission also somewhere in uh, the 2000s as compared to India. Uh, when we talk about the Chinese projects, they have invested in more of the huge big infrastructure projects as compared to India which has focused more on the high impact community development projects. So it more so happens in the eyes of the, uh, the citizens that you aim to see more big projects and like for them the uh, airport coming up or the bridge which was able to ease their lives as compared to the high impact community development projects where India has done immense which has touched the life of Maldivian, whether it is opening gyms for them, whether it is hospitals, whether it is giving them buses, whether it is giving them being the first country to give the vaccines, being the first country to uh, have an air bubble arrangement with them, which, pick, which picked up their economy to a large extent. Uh, and also, uh, though the track record of the Chinese, no doubt, has been... Uh, uh, up to the mark as in they have completed the project but one thing that we need to keep in mind is that uh, after uh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka Maldives is the third country which owes huge amount of money to China and South Asia out of the economy which is hardly 6.5 billion dollars they own almost 1.3 billion and estimates say that they might be up to 3.5 billion dollars that they owe to China so and these are reports which have been analysis which have been done in past three four years we do not want to see a repetition of the Lanka story in South Asia again, where India went out of its way to help its neighbor. And it's not something that uh, uh, because India shares that brotherhood ties, India goes out of its way to help Lanka when nobody was able to. And literally India had to go out of its own pocket to help the country. Second question, why China is more attracted to Maldives? What brings them to Malé? is I think according to my analysis is a lot of uh, strategic reasons, particularly uh, out of the 10 routes or the 10 suppliers, basically the 10 suppliers for China, the routes of nine for the oil passes through the Indian Ocean region, one most important thing, and they want to secure these resources. Secondly, if you see uh, one very important point, which I bring out uh, because of the centrality or the location of the Malay is in the Central Indian Ocean. The Central Indian Ocean is the second richest source of the ferromanganese deposits in the world. And these are rich in the critical minerals and rare earth metals, which are used extensively for the green technologies and the future military systems, the electronic equipments. The very important thing and which favors India in this case is that uh, according to International Seabed Authority, India has been granted an area of 75,000 square kilometers to uh, undertake mining in this region as compared to China, which has been granted only 10,000 square kilometers. The other region what attracts China, I think, to the uh, Indian Ocean is more of the what remains to be seen is that what kind of developments is China going to take, particularly after they are taking a lot of activities in the island states now. Uh, for example, when we see that they are building an intelligence post in Coco's Island of Myanmar, they have built a submarine base in Bangladesh. They have uh, docked their research vessels, what they called as research vessels, which undertake research particularly related to the um, the scanning of the seabed, the oxygen levels, the turbidity, the salinity. And when they are bringing their vessels, not from the Malacca Straits, but through the alternative ingresses, that is the Lombok and the Vetar Straits. Particularly at a time when their ship was docked at Sri Lanka, that was the time when India was launching its satellites. 
this remains very important for india because andaman and nicobar is central to india so they are playing on these island states and they also claim that uh, for these resources they are going to deploy three satellites particularly to uh, map the indian ocean and already a, uh, the space port is coming in djibouti so i think there are a lot of concerns which china is trying uh, china has concerns and it is responding and of course the other concerns remains that um, china has used this particular vacuum when the other powers were not so involved when uh, except india the other major powers like us and all but are the other powers being more involved now in let's let's stick to maldives are the other powers getting more involved in the maldives now i i don't see uh, the same level of involvement number one and number two since you mentioned about uh, since since you talk about uh, the uh, you know the various uh, chinese projects which have been taking place there was that particular project in one of the northern islands uh, of of Mo uh, of maldives which actually sits astride the shipping lanes uh i think they were planning an observation post or at least they claimed that they were planning an observation post uh but you know if you get into a debt trap kind of a situation then what does it take to convert an observation post into some kind of a military base which then monitors the entire traffic in the indian ocean which i think uh, would be a matter of very very serious concern uh, to countries like india and obviously many other countries uh will that then uh, become a kind of a will that poison the well uh, of relations between india and maldives if something like that was to happen talk about the involvement of the other powers i would say that it is picking up uh us is opening its first embassy mission and just next to us is australia japan has been involved for quite a long time in maldives they were the first one to provide them with the sea walls so they are picking if you talk about the involvement of other powers definitely it is picking up apart from uh, india has been involved and uh, this uh, the thing which you are saying about the the that what i say as is it a race for a base or is it a strategic place that you are trying to acquire in the indian ocean and more so because of these some gray zone activities which are not very clearly which you cannot question that they are not developmental projects but at the same time you can question that they do have some kind of strategic implications these projects do have uh, how will it impact the india maltese i think uh, that remains to be seen that the kind of involvement uh, the any kind any government will bring to mali but one thing i am very quite assured and this was on the base of some of the interviews which were conducted with the maldivians and i think uh, president uh, moizo to be president uh, moizo has al uh, also mentioned that defense cooperation with india remains their foremost priority and that will not be taken by any other country they are very very clear they might bring for the developmental purposes the other country but as far as the defense cooperation is concerned india is the first answer to them so i think uh, the debate about the china's question is how do they define defense cooperation you can't be kicking out uh, yeah, exactly. defense personnel and then want defense cooperation so i this so i That's think part of the gray zone activity <laughs> or what uh, so no uh, i mean when we talk about yes one thing that i we need to know that when they are talking about sending back the indian personals they are the same personals who saved 200 maldivians they have helped airlift maldivians from one island to the other and they are the people who are helping them operate so even if you kick out 75 you will need someone if you have the donier aircrafts of india if you have the two helicopters of india then you will need someone to operate them so that that of course remains an uh, defense cooperation is not just related to exchange of equipments it is much more india takes training of nearly 70% of maldivians so i think the government will have to think twice they have been repeatedly mentioning it but i think india has also been opening to the diplomatic channels that they will sit with the government and discuss this particular issue mimra if i can just uh, come back to you now we we've, we've discussed the politics we've discussed the foreign policy uh but i think it's important to discuss economics uh, dr rashida adidi had spoken about you know um, how much economics matters in politics what people need um, so what exactly is the new government going to do different uh, to to address some of the pressing economic problems 
uh, including of uh, of uh, Maldives uh, debt to other countries uh, is there a plan of action or uh, is it that they will start doing things as they go along is there a clear plan of action on how they plan to proceed in terms of a clear plan of action uh, i'm i'm sorry to say i have not seen any concrete plan of action uh, by any of our candidates i mean even uh, in the lead up to the election both uh, muizu and president solio had been making a number of very lavish campaign promises that are completely discrepant with the uh, debt situation in the maldives so currently our debt servicing requirements amount to uh, approximately 500 to 600 dollars every year we have an upcoming payment debt uh, repayment schedule of uh, 1 billion us dollars in 2026 which amounts to uh, about a 1/5 or 1/6 of our gdp um and in terms of the pledges that both the mdp government and the incoming tnc government had made i i i i don't see any indication that these are issues that uh, any party in the maldives has been taken seriously for instance even going back to the solihu administration uh, back in january of this year they had raised the goods and services tax uh, because they needed to generate more government uh, revenue uh, in 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 because of our heavy debt servicing requirements and because of the fragile condition of our economy post covid however uh, on the eve of the elections they have announced a number of uh, measures to increase uh, the salaries of civil servants uh, especially those working in certain sectors such as health uh, they have pledged to keep subsidizing utilities which is a huge fiscal burden on the government uh and to match that uh moizu has simply said that he will uh he will simply amplify the government's measures so if they prom- uh, uh, promise to subsidize utilities to a certain extent they will uh they pledge to subsidize it even further if the government has promised to uh raise uh the salaries of uh public sector workers moizu has been vague on whether or not he's going to continue that or whether he's going to uh reverse these measures so i i have not really seen any kind of concrete proposals uh from i, I either the current government that is exiting or the incoming government with regard to how they are actually going to approach the uh, economic situation in the maldives dr didi if i can um, turn to you uh, on a somewhat similar thing uh, there has been some speculation in some quarters that uh, Maldives could consider leasing out islands uh, some islands on a long term basis uh, to some of the countries including china uh, and 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 uh, you know use that as a kind of a money spinner in one form or another uh, ha- do you think that's possible or do you think that's going to create a, a massive uh, a backlash within uh, within the country Uh, if something like that was to happen because there are other countries which have done something similar uh, do you think something similar could happen in the case of maldives or do you think that's kind of just speculation and far fetched dr didi uh, yes they have done it um even to china they have leased uh, islands leasing of course not selling uh, islands for 99 years and so on but after bending the law um so but it's not to a great extent that this has been done and of course maldivians don't like the idea of the islands going to foreigners but um it, it has been done as i said i don't think this will be done by this government also on a large scale you know it's not like messing out um 20 islands to china to 25 to india or whatever us and so on i don't think it's going to happen at that scale but it could happen the one couple of islands here and there in the name of um some kind of um developmental process there would of course there's the pretense of development for everything so that could happen but if that happens yes as you say there would be 
uh, not a huge uproar because people, not too many people would know about it. But those who are conscious of this, those who are aware, those who would be aware of this kind of thing, would um, uh, would um, talk ag against that. Definitely will protest against it. Uh, Aditya, don't you think it makes sense for the Maldives to play India against China? Look, if I was a small country, I had two neighbors or two big countries, uh, you know, vying for my attention. I'd love to play them off against each other and maximize the benefit. I don't know if Maldives will be able to do it. Uh, but don't you think it makes a lot of sense for some, them to do something like this? No, I, I do think that um, for a small island country which needs a lot of money, that's that China has and for obvious uh, security and geographical reasons that India provides. I think it, it is something that Maldives will definitely uh, would like to do. And, and, and going by the history of it, you know, even back in the Gayum era, we said that, um, you know, Maldives India relationship was at an all time high, yet yet he uh, had diplomatic relations with China, although not this extent. Then we come to Nasheed's time. Uh, well, in the lead up to elections in his first uh, presidential election, he was again uh, behind China. but. It was Nasheed who actually signed, um, who actually finalized on a Chinese diplomatic mission in Mali, right? Um, and uh, following that, then comes to the Solis time or Yamin's time is something that's well known. Basically, he tried to play a four-way round, um, uh, you know, play China, India against each other, and then also reached out to Japan and Saudi Arabia at the same point of time. But eventually, it changed and it became something of a pro-China and a complete anti-India. Uh, policy for obvious nationalistic and domestic reasons and also, um, you know, the China factor in there. Uh, again, uh, Solis time, we see sim something similar happening. It was an India first policy. Obviously, the government had very real uh, good relationship with India. But um, that does, didn't stop Chinese from entering into the Maldives. That didn't stop Chinese from investing into new projects. Yes, the, the intensity dec decreased. But it still persisted. And even at times, uh, the Maldivian government had stepped in to protect some Maldivian politician uh, from what they owed to China. So I think that kind of a balance game is something that we are seeing all throughout South Asia, not only in, in Maldives, in, in everywhere around. And I think Maldives would pretty much use it for its own leverage, given the conditions it's in right now. Um, economically, it's not in the best position. It would want some kind of a saving. And um, given the way that Indo-Pacific is evolving into a major geopolitical region of contestation, I think Maldives would pretty much want to keep its option open. Why, why shut off yourself from being loyal to one country when you know you can get the best from, uh, you know, by by playing one country against each other? Why, you know, uh, why restrict Chinese economic investments coming into Maldives just because you have to be pro-India? Why you know, restrict the security cooperation that comes with India that, you know, that you might not get while you are close to China? So I think it's that that phenomenon will continue. Okay, so Radhe Tambe, let me just turn this question around and turn it on its head. Uh, to be able to play two big countries against each other, uh, you require a lot of diplomatic skill, but then those two countries also have a vote on how much they're willing to play ball with you. How much do you think uh, the two countries will be ready to play ball uh, and, and try and compete with each other? And how much do you think they will try and, uh, uh, what is the correct phraseology so that I don't rile up anybody, but basically try and impose themselves uh, and and shut out the other guy? Uh, how much do you think that will happen? Secondly, and that's related, uh, is Maldivian nationalism uh, defined as anti-Indiaism? Because if it is, then the dynamics changes, doesn't it? Uh, responding to your first question, where you say that uh, how well will India and China be playing against each other in Maldives? Um, most of it is seen as that any upcoming ch uh, Chinese project, if it's coming up, then India will be responding it through via a project. But uh, I think this will be a very myopic view of the relation that India has had with Mali because it is not new for India. India has been doing even before China came. India had been doing when China, when there was a pro-China government and even after when it was a kind of, a, even during the Soli government. So this doesn't stop India's engagement. But however, uh, to put it on the other side, I think China is doing a lot to compete with India, particularly when I uh, see China is playing a lot of institutional role now, bringing these countries into some kind of, uh, uh, they organized last December some um, 
China Indian Ocean Region Forum in 22, trying to bring together these Indian Ocean countries. Whereas uh, India, of course, has... Uh, for India, it was not new. India had the institutional arrangement, something in the region, for example, IORA, which was not new. India was one of those countries which helped Mali to join uh, IORA in, uh, recently under the Soli government. India revived the uh, Colombo security conclave under the Soli government. But particularly when it comes to projects, I don't think uh, uh, India will be the one which will be competing, yes. India might fasten its pace of its projects, that can be seen. But uh, I don't think that India will be playing this game of uh, that India needs to put out China. But yes, to a certain extent, India will now need to gear up its projects, its work to have its influence more deeper and wider amongst the not only the society, because I think but also in the uh, by dealing with the political parties across the spectrum. That is something which India will need to do and uh, pull up its socks for that. And um, Second question. Um, I think it was on uh, Maldivian nationalism. Oh, uh, yeah. As I think uh, that is uh, something uh, painting a picture with one brush. And then you say that something uh, that it is and uh, the nationalism is anti India. I don't think it is that. Uh, it is just restricted to particular parties that have come up. And the way it was mobilized, particularly under the recent elections, was something that across the uh, analysis that we read across was something that it was seen as India versus China. And it was just seen as something, oh, that India out. India has, can you really do India out is a question that we should ask ourselves for the kind of work India has done, whether it has been diplomacy, whether it has been capacity building, information dominance, it has been economic cooperation, military arrangements with them is something India's response as a proximate power, I don't think any country has been able to replace it till now. Uh, okay, last question. Uh, Aditya, this one is to you because it's from an Indian perspective. Are there any red lines that India has which it would expect uh, any government in Malay not to, uh, not, not to violate? I think multiple, not just one. Uh, the first one pro probably comes from uh, the economic investments of it. What if uh, Moizu's government does the same thing that Yamin had done uh, back in the 2012-2013 time? You know, get done away with Indian investors, Indian investments. Rather have a Chinese investor invest in your own projects that you kickstarted. Right, that's red line one. I think red line two would be something that again Yamin did. Uh, in 2017-2018, abruptly call Indian, um, uh, abruptly call on India to withdraw its helicopters, not give enough space time to even do that, and um, and uh, call India as someone who has been, uh, you know, uh, violating your sovereignty. I think, I think that's precisely what Muizu is trying to avoid this time by saying that I would rather have a diplomatic negotiation to oust this 75 personnel rather than. Um, doing whatever Yamin did. So I think this is this is the second red line that probably India would be wary of. And uh, the third dead, uh, red line is probably if, if new Chinese investments come up, what if, what if uh, you know, the joint observationary research uh, project comes back into the life? Or what if China gets hold of Maldives uh, in, in terms of having a small island for a lease, which is uh, closer to India? I think these are multiple red lines that both India uh, is working to avoid. And I think Maldives also knows where to draw from, given by its previous experiences with Yamin's government. Uh, okay, uh, the floor is now open. Please identify yourself, and please, uh, please tell me uh, who you are directing the question to. Uh, so please, uh, yeah. Good afternoon, sir and ma'am. It was a wonderful experience hearing you. My my name is Shivam. Okay. Uh, identify okay. yourself. My name is Shivam and I am currently preparing for Indian Civil Services. My question is to Aditya sir, if you permit sir. Um, sir, my question was that as we also talked here that India Indian military's presence in Maldives, it's a very minuscule presence. So how is it possible and it is projected as a threat to Maldivian security. So how is it and we have seen that how Indian military has been a responder in the first case there. So how is how was it possible that this whole narrative could be created that it is against Maldivian security? And very small question to Radhe, ma'am. It was a pleasure hearing you. Ma'am, you talked how uh, Indian projects were there, uh, which were creating a big impact among public, but still the public had a very uh, very generous view towards Chinese projects. So did the Indian 
so the, the indian uh, domestic politics the rhetoric that indian present indian government is working against muslims did they think played a role in creating that perception among maldivian public hello my name is puskar i am from jamia Mil- jamia millia islamia my question to mimra sir first you mentioning about the democratic transition in maldives in 2008 so uh, when and in 2013 there is a di- disruption and how you can uh, analyze the evolution of the political behavior in maldives from the uh, democratic the democratic transition democratic transition happen in maldives happen uh, in the maldivian pop bit among the maldivian population so how can they impact foreign policy uh, i don't know if I, okay yeah my name is oritro ghosh and i'm a ma international relations student from the south asian university my question was for dr rasheeda uh, didi so uh, the question that i had was more of a clarification so i was intrigued by the topic of maldives lease, leasing islands to foreigners so my question is is the maldives government setting conditions to these lease, leasings or the countries that will be taking lease of these countries uh, of these islands uh, they can use these islands in in any way that they feel fit so is there a worry that they may be leasing these islands and including military presence within these smaller islands Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Holder-Ross from the British High Commission. Um, first of all, just a comment. I think um, the, the UK has had a resident High Commissioner in uh, Maldives since 2019. I think it's fantastic that more like-minded countries are opening up missions there. I think it's really important um, that we have representation. Um, my questions were, uh, first of all, to Aditya, I'd be really interested in understanding how India would respond, in your view, if any of those uh, aforementioned red lines were to be breached. Um, and then secondly, I'd be interested in um, in uh, in responses to the question about election interference and whether there have been any signs of of uh, countries inserting themselves into the democratic debate. Thank you. I think we can answer this first round and then we can go in further. So let me start with uh, Dr. Didi first. Uh, there was a question to you, ma'am, uh, if you can answer that. Yes, about leasing. Now, that's not a common practice. I think it was given just to China and other islands. The, the way it works is that um, <clears throat> now see in the in the Maldives land belongs to the state. So the way it, uh, it works is that Maldivians have um, over the years leased small islands from the government and, and they might grow in, in the olden days, they would grow coconut trees or uh, whatever, you know, plant some things and so on. But now the leasing is done. So from that person, the foreigner leases the island and builds a um, resort and so on. But the Chi- in the case of Chinese, I think even one island was given for them, leased, leased, when I say given, that's the wrong word, um, leased for developing some kind of... Um, uh, agriculture. It wasn't agriculture. I forget exactly the word, but I don't think it's working. So it's not a common practice or policy that the government had adopted. That okay, we we'll, we we'll lease, we we'll lease or give um, rent, uh, give the islands to foreigners. So that's not that. It was just a uh, one or two occasions on one or two occasions that this has happened, and I'm not quite sure if the island. <clears throat> given to um, China is even, in fact, functioning with whatever they were planning to function, um, work on that. So that's how it is. Yeah. Mimra, you uh-huh. had a question directed to you. Sure. Uh, so there were two components to that question. First, in terms of uh, how uh, democratic trajectory has been in terms of strengthening our institutions and democratic consolidation. And the second component of it was how it uh, affects our foreign policy. Um, well, with regard to the first component, we're still a very young democracy, uh, and we are going through the growing pangs of a young democracy. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned in my uh, initial remarks, we uh, had a very controversial transfer of power uh, when our first democratically elected government of Mohammed Nasheed he was ousted uh, under very controversial circumstances in February uh, 2012. 
the election subsequent to that uh, were extremely marred uh, with court interference, with delays, with annulments. Uh, and after Yamin Abdul Gayoom, he took power, there were a lot of democratic reversals in terms of uh, uh, there were restrictions on freedom of assembly. There were threats directed at journalists. Uh, two journalists, two prominent journalists, were either murdered or disappeared under uh, violent circumstances. Uh, and in the lead up to the 2018 elections, um, uh, because Yamin's entire political opposition was incarcerated, uh, there wasn't really a free and fair political landscape. So when Solihu won in 2018, it was very much celebrated as a, as a victory of democratic forces prevailing over the forces of uh, autocracy. But in hindsight, that narrative also has been quite uh, problematic. And there's more nuance to that because uh, the Solihu government was also very much a lost uh, opportunity because they did not uh, reverse any of the restrictions on freedom of assembly that uh, the Yamin government had uh, uh, enforced. And while things were more stable on the surface, uh, there was still a lot of state abuse of uh, uh, resources in, th throughout the, the presidential tenure, and especially uh, during the lead up to the elections. And while Yamin Abdul Gayoom himself is someone who is very plausibly accused of having taken part in uh, the corruption scandals of his administration, it does come across as uh, politically expedient that he is the only member uh, of Solihu's opposition that was incarcerated on these charges, whereas a number of people who had similar accusations against them uh, are not only free, they comprised uh, the government, uh, I, I, either in cabinet or in, in prominent political offices. Uh, but uh, the, there are promising signs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this has been a competitive democratic elections. Eight contestants were allowed to compete. Uh, Solihu conceded he didn't uh, uh, question the results. There will be a peaceful transfer of power in November, all else being equal. Um, so there are both hopeful signs for our future democratic trajectory, and uh, but also worrying precedents in terms of how uh, different administrations have not really lived up to the democratic values and principles enshrined in our constitution. In terms of how all of this affects our foreign policy, um, for better or worse, our politics has become quite uh, factionalized. And unfortunately, uh, our politicians aren't really very responsible uh, with regard to what they say on the campaign trail to the point that you really have to differentiate what they, what they say on the campaign trail versus what they actually do while they are in government. Uh, for instance, uh, Yamin, he's very associated with an India out posture. However, when he took power in 2013, uh, he made a concerted effort to try and fix Maldives Indian relations. His first visit was to India. Uh, he maintained an India first foreign policy throughout his tenure. It is under the defense cooperation agreement that he signed with India in 2016 that the current government uh, has proceeded on a number of projects with India that the PPM, PNC are claiming uh, facilitating an uh, uh, undue military presence in the Maldives. So a, a lot of this anti-India rhetoric is essentially aimed at, uh, uh, it's targeted at a domestic audience uh, in order to garner votes then it is really a sincere statement of uh, foreign policy stance. Uh, if you look at the Converse example, uh, when the MDP were in opposition uh, in the lead up to the 2018 elections, they made a, a big fuss about how our debts to China were uh, entangling us in debt traps, how uh, cooperation with China is by itself problematic because of, of Beijing's uh, broader uh, intentions in the Indian Ocean region. But once in power, they have uh, proceeded with a number of projects with China, including the renovation of uh, foreign ministry building, which is one of the most sensitive uh, buildings in the country, uh, housing projects uh, in Holomale, uh, maintaining uh, the bridge. Uh, so what we see is that every five years when there's an election, India and China will bear the brunt of anti-campaigning discourse. 
And then once the administration either, uh, whether they stay in power or they, uh, or a different administration takes power, they have to embark on a project of uh, damage control. Uh, so those are the dynamics at play. Uh, so if, if there's one take, away from my comments that I really want to emphasize is that you really do have to see the disconnect between what Maldivian politicians say uh, when they're on the campaign trail versus what they actually do when they're in, in power. Uh, answering to your question, I think uh, that anti-Muslim perception, I don't agree with uh, that point. But as far as the projects that you have concerned that have Indian projects been able to, why they have not been able to make that impact, right? I think one point which... Uh, comes during my analysis is that India has lagged in a lot of publicity, you know, the publicity of its projects. But it also has a predicament from the other side because uh, Indian projects have, as I said, are not new. But uh, while talking to some of the senior officials, I think they were very clear that India is not very keen on publicizing these projects because the smaller countries, they look at it from the other side. For them, it appears then in the eye that whatever you are taking, you're taking so much from India. So it's from both sides, uh, and I think for that we maintain some kind of balance. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Shyam. I think you asked the question about uh, the Indian military personnel being small. See, I think this is not a recent development, right? Uh, the uh, anti-Indian campaign or running or making accusations that India is violating our sovereignty has been something that's been there. Uh, for a while, uh, look at the GMR projects or uh, look at Yamin's last year, uh, you know, the last years in power. So this has been there. What PPM, PNC rather did starting from uh, 2020 was just amplify this a bit, make this most, uh, you know, uh, uh, broaden the, uh, you know, debate that was happening in terms of what are the Indian military troops doing in Maldives and make it more nationalistic as much as possible. Right now, what, how did this campaign become successful is a story in itself, probably because one, uh, in the initial days, the government was also too hesitant to share information on what's happening. Uh, when the Dornier aircraft was handed over, it appeared as if it, it appeared out of the blue and no one was there to provide any kind of clarification. Um, in the initial days, the government also rejected that there are no Indian troops in, in the Maldivian uh, soil. And later, they went on to acknowledge that these are unarmed troops who are here to look after the Maldives. What this offered is a complete uh, uh, fodder, uh, the fertilizer for opposition to grow their anti-India rhetoric and anti-India campaign. The disinformation campaigns were completely successful. The India Out campaign was completely... Uh, very neatly designed, very neatly structured, distributed among uh, all the political parties and all the uh, affiliates of these political parties. It was, India Out was trending in Maldives for a long, long time. And this campaign became in, be, began in 2020 when the elections were in 2023. You know, that kind of a big gap is where this disinformation came in. And I think one factor that also helped uh, the uh, PPM, PNC to run this campaign very successfully is also... Um, you know, uh, providing false documents, you know, the false documents in the name of saying that India is doing this or India is probably having its troops in the ground. Uh, and also e essentially using the lack of information that the government was providing. So, for example, the UTF harbor, there were multiple documents com consistently forged and said, oh, look, India is harboring, uh, India is building a new dock for itself. Right. And then su subsequently, this debate became became about, oh, India is bringing another couple of, uh, uh, another 30 or 40 uh, troops in the next 15, 20 years into the Maldives, the UTF agreement has allowed them to uh, uh, bring in new military personnel on the ground. So this amount of information, I think, uh, lack of information from the government and, you know, uh, probably give credit for the disinformation campaign that the opposition ran very efficiently. I think that's where the uh, India Out campaign became so successful in its case. Um, I think uh, back to Chris, um, what happens if the red lines are drawn? I don't know. I don't want to make any speculations. The question is, if the red lines are drawn and what happens after if the red lines are drawn? I think India has enough leverages to pull. Uh, Maldives and India have a very uh, good relationship in terms of uh, diaspora, in terms of economic relations, in terms of uh, even, even in case if any Maldivian has to get, uh, 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 has to diagnose him, uh, himself or herself with anything serious, they will have to travel to India. So I think it's not that we don't have any leverages. We do, right? Uh, but probably we wouldn't want to have something of a military confrontation or a direct military action, which a lot of opposition have ran, ran their campaign against. But I think probably India would be more cautious and India would probably wait and watch uh, on how the developments will happen. 
um and i think there's also one side of the argument that you see the uh, that like minded partners are coordinating and cooperating in south asia and also in maldives when when a, sp a chinese spy ship comes to dock in colombo it's just not india that expresses concern but also the us right and i think if if um maldives tries to uh, you know have a military base or, or a chinese host a chinese military base or observation post i think the concerns would be not only be coming from india but also from other development partners and like minded partners so i think that is something that probably maldives will keep in mind or the new incoming government will keep in mind before violating any uh, red lines uh in terms of external interference in elections i don't think there was any kind of external interference uh in fact this election was one of the uh, as as mimra has credited president soli i think this is one of the uh, most peacefully transited um, peacefully held elections but um i think there was always another angle to it it's it's not about interference but it's about the foreign policy choices that each and every government make mdp had made a clear choice that it would want to prioritize india and it also made sure that it would capitalize whatever investments and economic benefits it would get for its own electoral benefits i think it's a similar thing that yamin ran back in the day uh, after having the greater male connectivity uh, sorry after having the uh, sina male bridge i think he, they, he ran on a complete campaign saying that we have brought in so much investments uh, from different countries so i think it's it's indirectly related to it but i don't think there was any kind of direct interference of uh, external powers in the elections that took place hello uh, my name is pranjal and i am pursuing ma in political science from delhi university so my question is to the radhe ma'am regarding the nature of development you said that how china has focused on a big infrastructure and it has a certain gimmick in compared to the development which is of india which is more community centered so do you think after the elections will the india change its nature and orientation of development to focus more on infrastructure and compete with china um, greetings everyone my name is tanishk from university of delhi my question is to uh, rashida didi uh, ma'am you mentioned that uh, there is Uh, a form of disguised unemployment within the government it itself like uh, where four people could run the mission there were 17 who were actually working so could you uh, please shed some light on the reasons behind this that uh, four times the requirement people are working and getting the salary is it due to the corruption or uh, nepotism uh, please throw some light on what's happening within the cabinet of maldives government it's on uh Thank you very much. So my name is Chopra, and I'm a retired naval officer. I've got two small questions. I know one comment and one question. Question: This first question is, uh, I like to ask, uh, is oh, there's nobody spoken about GAN? What's happened to the the airfield at GAN, which is very strategically placed? And India had an interest in it. There was a lot of talk of and talk in India. What you know, should we go to GAN? Not go, as it is. We, I mean. I, as we uh, as usual we didn't take make up our minds etc and i don't know what has happened to gan is it still there i mean of course we have, the airfield is there but I, who who's who's going who's gone there my second uh, just a statement is that uh, i was involved in the that time i was working with the ongc in the negotiations for the oil fields in kazakhstan and the india and china were in competition for those and i saw the working of the chinese uh, very they take decisions first of all they work very hard decisions are very quick they bribe uh and once they've got the project then they work very hard and complete it indians on the other hand don't take any decisions the all the control is with the bureaucrats and this and the indians want bribes as compared to the chinese the chinese giving bribes to the local and the implementation is extremely poor and uh, it takes years you know to for any project to go through and therefore in spite of all this talk about uh, the debt trap of the chinese and all that they're still getting projects all over the world in fact the brf is is going on at the moment in 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 beijing could you just comment on this aspect as well thank you uh hello sir my name is imanshu and i am from university of delhi uh my question to uh, aditya sir and radhe ma'am is uh, what can be the possible larger and long term diplomatic solutions that are rest with india 
as one by one our traditional uh, partners such as sri lanka nepal and now maldives they are being lured by chinese a uh, debt trap policies my name is ks jangpangi my question is to the maldivian maldivian friends again going back to the india out campaign i just wanted to know how much of this campaign was a electoral rhetoric or it was really it was real i want to know the extent of these two possibilities and secondly how much of this india out campaign in the maldives bears this type of uh, you know public opinion is maldivian public in general is against india does it suggest that or it is mere a political rhetoric Uh, okay, so what we'll do is uh, this time we'll start the other way around. Uh, Radhe, you go first, Aditya, and then we'll give our, our friends from Maldives the last word. Please. Oh uh, yeah, so I'll pick up with the last question first. That you talk about that what could what should India do to have some long term ties with its neighbors? And now Maldives isn't that. I think uh, the first thing which I would. comment is that um it's high time that india is one of the leading voices and an agenda setters that india should now engage with the political parties across the spectrum in the neighboring countries india is a country which is sitting in the geography which has deep civilizational and people to people ties cannot afford to have ties with one political party they cannot appear even if it india does not have it should not appear as something that we are having second i think institutional engagements is something which lends a certain kind of certainty amongst uncertainties and a predicament of intent and implementation is something the institutional engagements do so that is something which can forge more deeper ties and will withstand the change in governments and um, third i think a uh, very important is that how india can play a very pivotal role in this particular region by dealing by helping them deal with their non traditional security threats though do we we do have lot of organizations in this region iora indian ocean naval symposium indian ocean commission and colombo security conclave but none of the organizations have been really been able to deal with the threats by keeping the politics out can india be that leader in doing that so that is and uh, i think uh, one question was from behind uh, where it was about that how um, will india change its approach after the elections as far as high impact community development projects are concerned and will it um, so i don't think that india will change that approach this approach actually uh, india has been following in other countries like bhutan and nepal and also uh, when it comes to maldives though it has been something that uh, which really uh, saw its uh, light in the document something recently under the government but i don't think that we will see a change because uh, india has already started doing a lot by gifting them led lights developing volleyball courts stadiums for them so and uh, yes the second part of the question where you talk about that will india be taking up some big infrastructure projects i think india is already on its way and to quote uh, the current foreign minister abdullah shahid where he said that uh, apart from the mali connectivity project other indian projects have been on time and uh, there has been a meeting with the uh, external affairs minister to pick up the pace for what are the hurdles in this project also so yeah thank you i think i'll i'll pick up from where radhe left on the question on is there a broader solution for how india will try to solidify its relations in the neighbor i don't think there is a solution i don't think it's a border dispute or it's it's a perceptional difference that you can find a solution it's a broader structural uh, evolution in the broader indo pacific region in south asian region uh, for so long um, india was a major power in the region till 90s 2000 uh, yet uh, countries tried to play india against each other uh, india against the us sometimes in, in, in for example in sri lanka or sometimes russia against india uh, although to a varied scale i, I don't think there will be any solution that's coming out uh, after all that china has invested so much and china has so much to offer in terms of economy uh, finance and money etc i don't think there will be an end to it so i i think what india will do or probably what india is trying to do is is emphasize on connectivity try to have more economic integration uh, push for more people to people relations and you know try to sort out differences but i don't think having close relations with the government will stop them from playing a china card or having a close relation with china will stop a uh, precise uh, a political party from playing india card i think that's a broader structural change uh, i don't think anyone wants to alienate uh, each other um, but then uh, speaking of um, the airfield in gan i don't 
think I don't see uh, anything being public in the last five years. It has not been discussed, uh, probably uh, for domestic reasons, uh, especially when the anti-India campaign picked up its pace. And uh, I, I think that also should have been one of the deterrents that has not put uh, the Khan airfield back in the tracks of negotiation. Uh, but otherwise, um, there were been there have been negotiations uh, in the past. I think there was some interest, but uh, I think that. Uh, there, there's been uh, in in the past, India had also been very shy to come out of its own comfort zone and invest into broader um, uh, defense cooperation, defense sector cooperation. So, and that's and that has changed in recent years, and that's why we see UTF picking up its pace. Even in the initial years, UTF had not picked up a lot of pace till late 2018 or 2019. I think that's that's where this whole thing begins. I think that's also the similar fate with Gan. Probably, what has deterred is it the domestic developments that has revolved around India out and the current. Uh, government uh, for now. Um, in terms of Indian inefficiency, I think again it, it comes to the same thing. Uh, in terms of India, India's investment in neighborhood has been um, has largely been high impact community development projects. Recently, it has also picked up a lot of uh, interest in mega infrastructure project. It has not yet been there. It has not been able to invest because probably uh, the impact community development projects are more of a comfort zone for India. Um, will this change in the coming future? Probably India is pushing more and more for connectivity, for economic integration. We have massive projects lined up all throughout the neighborhood. Uh, I think that is something that probably India is working on. But again, uh, delivering on the project, uh, sticking to the deadline is something that is uh, that India lacks. And probably that has also caused uh, some of the... Uh, um, uh, governments that have been trying to push for pro-India connectivity, especially uh, even in the case you see MDP or Ibrahim Soli, uh, how he had to take a lot of criticism for having a complete or some, as some politicians claimed, uh, India only foreign policy and never managed to get these projects implemented on time. I think that's it. Dr. Didi, uh, there was a question to you. Yes, definitely it is corruption. Uh, corruption in the sense it may not be it may not be necessarily nepotism but it's giving um uh, uh, giving jobs to people whose children for example i've been hearing a lot about um parliamentarians children um have been given jobs in uh, in the for, in the foreign service every mission every embassy has these people who are not really doing any work and so we unfortunately yes that is corruption because the government should be able to um, deny that deny that kind of um, uh, requests i suppose the requests come from their parents and um, so that's one thing i have heard of and many people pointed that out um, so that's some. Um, that's what I'm going to say. It's it is corruption, unfortunately. Last word to you. So to address this question about how much of the India Out uh, campaign is sincere and how much of it is driven by sheer political calculation, uh, ju just to answer that in reverse order, uh, there no does need to be a base that appeals to. So uh, unfortunately, there would be some segments of our population that such messaging would resonate with. Um, there hasn't really been uh, much surveys or da data that I can extrapolate uh, numbers from. Uh, but in terms of it being made an election issue and it being made a successful election issue uh, would warrant that going forward, there needs to be some kind of uh, positive PR engagement that would sort of uh, reverse this uh, impression that maybe India is too heavy handed or that they represent uh, a threat to the Maldives uh, sovereignty. Having said that, uh, political calculation does play very much into that rhetoric. Because uh, again, to use the example of former President Yamin Abdul Gayum, Towards the end of his term, yes, he did uh, engage in a lot of India out rhetoric and he did uh, uh, request that uh, the Indian helicopters leave the Maldives. But there's a broader political context there as well. This was after India criticized him, uh, after he declared a state of emergency in response to a Supreme Court order mandating that he release all political prisoners. When India criticized this decision, he essentially uh, threw a tantrum. Um, 
But if you look at his statements earlier on in his administration, whether it's his initial uh, decision to go to India as his first official state visit, because he wanted to uh, sort of mend the ties uh, that had been damaged after the unceremonious exit of GMR uh, under the Wahid administration, which succeeded the democratically elected administration of Mohammed Nasheed. He uh, requested that our media, uh, he reiterated many times that our media should refrain from excessive or derogatory uh, criticism of, of, of India because it is not a partner that we can afford to alienate. Because at the end of the day, um, the Maldives does need to be, we are a small island, vulnerable state. Uh, sure, we, we have the agency to sort of uh, maybe play the bigger powers off against each other, but uh, we still require goodwill from larger geopolitical players in the Indian Ocean, whether it be uh, India, which is a natural resident there, or China, which has built up a strategic presence to uh, safeguard its strategic interest and maritime routes. But there is no other country besides India that can really... Uh, India is very hard to re replace in terms of its proximity, its ability to respond to the Maldives' immediate uh, emergency needs, whether those are natural uh, disasters, for instance, in the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami or in the 2040, 2014 water crisis. Uh, and even going further back uh, in the security sphere, uh, when in November 1988, India played a pivotal role in rescuing the administration of Yamin's half-brother, Mamun Abdul Gayum, uh, when he faced a threat to his administration by foreign mercenaries uh, from Sri Lanka with, uh, under the direction of local political discontents. All Maldivian politicians intuitively understand that India needs to be, uh, that we need to be on good terms with India. They are playing a very dangerous game when they uh, engage in this kind of uh, political rhetoric for campaigning purposes. And uh, going by their behavior when they are in power, uh, it's very soon demonstrated that that campaign rhetoric is insincere. For instance, Muizu, yes, he was not as vocal as Yamin in terms of uh, being a part of the India Out campaign. But having uh, b belonging to a faction that has made that a uh, priority campaign issue, he has very gradually started to soften that rhetoric after he became president-elect. Uh, one of his foreign policy advisors, uh, Mohammed Mundu Sharif, he specifically stated that India, the, the Indian Ocean, that India is the major stakeholder in the Indian Ocean region, which sort of indicates that he understands that India has these sensitivities and that the Maldives will respect them. Uh, Muizu has committed to maintaining an India first foreign policy. Uh, and whether he will actually go through with his commitment of removing uh, Indian personnel from the Maldives within a week of taking office. Uh, my, my personal opinion, and I might be proven wrong by subsequent events, especially once he takes power in November, is that that is hyperbole and that is meant to appeal to a base and that uh, things will proceed at a much slower and more reasonable pace uh, and in a manner that uh, respects Indian diplomatic sensitiv sensitivities. Uh, Memra Abdul Ghafoor, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rashid Adidi, thank you, uh, Rade Tambi, and of course, uh, my friend uh, Aditya and my colleague Aditya and uh, Shivam, uh, both of whom put together this whole thing. Uh, this was an excellent, uh, this was an education for me, I must admit. Uh, and uh, although Aditya keeps trying to educate me, but uh, this truly was an education, so thank you very much. Um, very enlightening. Uh, we hope to have uh, more such programs going forward uh, and we hope to see more of you uh, preferably in uh, in the physical form rather than in the virtual form. But I think the virtual form does work uh, quite well. Uh, so thanks a lot um, uh, to all the people on the panel and uh, everybody who's come here tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.